The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good morning, everyone. So lecture three of uh, four in the shortest path module. And today we'll finally confront uh, our nemesis, which are negative cycles and negative edges. And uh, we will uh, describe an algorithm that is due to two different people. They didn't collaborate to produce this algorithm, Bellman and Ford, to, which computes shortest paths uh, in a graph with negative edges. And not only that, even if the graph has negative cycles in it, the algorithm will be correct in the sense that it will report the existence of a negative cycle and essentially abort the computation of shortest paths that are undefined. And for the few vertices that do not have neg negative cycles in between them and the source, the algorithm will report correct shortest paths. So, it is a polynomial time algorithm. It's fairly easy to describe. And what we'll do is describe it, analyze its complexity. And for once, we'll do a formal proof of its correctness uh, to show that it reports the existence of negative cycles if they do exist. And if they don't exist, it correctly computes shortest path weights. So recall that when we look at the general case, of the shortest path problem, we're going to have, let's say, a vertex u that, in this case, happens to be our source. And let's say, for argument's sake, that we have a negative weight cycle, like so. So let me draw this in bold. And this happens to be a negative weight cycle. Let's assume that you know, all of these edges have positive weights, then if you have an algorithm that needs to work on this type of graph, what you want to be able to do is to detect that this negative cycle exists. And you're going to essentially say, if this vertex is uh, v1, for example, you want to be able to say delta u v1 is undefined. And similarly for v2, v3, et cetera. For all of these things, the shortest path lengths are undefined. Because you can essentially run through this negative cycle any number of times and get whatever shortest path weight you want. Um, for this node, let's call that v0, we have delta u v0 equals 2. And there's a simple path of length 1 in this case, that gets you from u to v0. You don't encounter a cycle or a negative cycle in between. So that's cool. All right? And of course, if you have an, a, a vertex over here, z, that can't be reached from u, then we're going to have delta u, z being infinity. And you kind of assume at the beginning of these algorithms that the source in this case, I call the source u. But the, uh, the, uh, the d shortest path to u would be 0. And all of the other ones are infinity. And some of them may stay infinity. Some of them may obtain finite shortest path weights. And some of them will be undefined if you have a graph with negative cycles in it. And so that's sort of the specification, if you will, or the requirements on the Bellman-Ford algorithm. We wanted to be able to do all of the things I just described. OK? So let's take a second look at our generic shortest path algorithm that I put up, I think, about a week ago. And this is a good review of our notation. But there are a couple more things that I want to say about this algorithm that I didn't get to last time. So you're given a graph, 
and you set all of the vertices in the graph to have infinite shortest path weights initially, set the predecessors to be nil, and then we'll set d of s to be 0. That's your source. And the main loop would be something like repeat select an edge. And we have a, a particular way of selecting this edge when we have positive edge weights that corresponds to the minimum priority. And we talked about Dijkstra, but we have maybe different ways of doing that. But you have to select an edge somehow. And then we relax that edge, u, v, w. And you know about the relaxation step. I won't bother writing it out uh, uh, right now, but it's basically something where you look at the value of dv, and if dv is greater than du plus the weight, uh, you relax the edge. And you keep doing this. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that you do in the relaxation is to set the predecessor pointers to be correct, and that's part of the relaxed routine. And you keep doing this until you can't relax anymore. All right? So that's our generic shortest path algorithm. Um, there are two problems with this algorithm. Uh, the first, which we talked about, and both of these have to do with the complexity. But the first one is that the complexity could be exponential time even for positive edge weights. And the particular example we talked about was something where you had an exponential number of paths. And if you had a graph that looks like this, uh, then it's possible that a pathological selection of edges is going to make you relax edges an exponential number of times. And in particular, if you have n nodes in this graph, it's possible that you'd end up getting a complexity of order 2 raised to n over 2. OK? So that's, that's one problem. Um, the second problem, which is actually a more obvious problem, is that this algorithm might not even terminate. If there's a, actually will not terminate the way it's written. If there's a negative weight cycle reachable from the source. All right, so there's, there's two problems. Um, we fixed the first one. In the case of positive edges or non-negative edges, we have a, a neat algorithm that is an efficient algorithm called Dijkstra that we talked about last time that fixed the first part. But we don't know yet how we're going to handle uh, negative cycles in the general case. We know how to handle negative edges in the case of a DAG, the directed acyclic graph, but not in the, not in the general case. Okay. So there's this great uh, little skit from Saturday Night Live from the 1980s, so way before your time, called the Five Minute University. Anybody seen this? All right, look it up on YouTube. Don't look it up during lecture, but afterwards. <laughs> um, uh, and so, so this is the character here is, is, is a, a person by the name of, uh, uh, I forget his real name, but his, 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 his uh, fake name is Father Guido Sarducci. Right? So what's this five-minute university about? Five-minute university, he, he's selling this notion that says, and he says, look, five years after you graduate, you're essentially going to remember nothing. Okay? I mean, you're, going to, you're not going to remember anything about all the courses you took, et cetera. So why waste your time on a, on a college education or waste money, $100,000 on a college education? You know, for 20 bucks, I'll, I'll teach you in five minutes 
what you're going to remember five years after you graduate, right? So here's a, here's, let's take it to an extreme. Here's a 30-second version of 6006. And this is what I want you to remember, you know, five years or 10 years or whatever after you graduate, all right? And, the, and maybe the 10-second version is polynomial time is great, okay? Exponential time is bad, and infinite time gets you fired, okay? <laughs> so that's all you need to remember. Uh, <laughs> No, that's not all you need to remember for the final. This happens you know, five years after you graduate, right? So you need to remember a lot more if you want to take your quiz next week and, and the final exam. But I think that's summarized over here. You have a generic shortest path algorithm, and uh, you realize that you know, if you do this wrong, you could, you could very easily uh, get into a situation where a polynomial time algorithm, and we know one for Dijkstra, turns into exponential time, in the worst case, you know, for a graph like that, because you're selecting edges wrongly. And in particular, uh, 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 that's problem number one. And problem number two is, if you have a, a graph that isn't what you expect, in this case, let's say you expected uh, a graph with no negative cycles or maybe not even negative edges in it, uh, you could easily get into a situation where your termination condition is such that your algorithm never completes. So we need to fix problem number two today using this algorithm called Bellman-Ford. And as it turns out, this, this algorithm is incredibly straightforward. I mean, its complexity we'll have to look at. But from a description standpoint, it's four lines of code. And let me put that up. So Bellman-Ford takes a graph, weights, and a source S. And you can assume an adjacency list specification of the graph, or the representation of the graph. And we'll do some initialization. It's exactly the same as in the generic case. Set the d values. We'll still be looking at the d values and talking about the relaxation operation. So we do an initialization. And then this, this algorithm has multiple passes goes for i equals 1 to v minus 1. So it does v minus 1 passes, roughly order v passes, where v is the number of vertices. And in each of these passes, for each edge uv belonging to e, it relaxes every edge. And just so everyone remembers, relax u, v, w is if d of v is greater than d of u plus w, u, v, then we'll set d, v to be and we also set pi, v to be u. Okay. That's relax operation over here. And so that's that's the algorithm. And uh, if you know magically that there are no negative cycles in the graph, right? So if there are no negative cycles in the graph, then after these, we'll have to prove this, but after these v minus 1 passes, you're going to get the correct shortest path weights. OK? Um, you want to do a little bit more, right? I motivated what we want Bellman Ford to do earlier in the lecture. And so you can also do a check. So you may not know if there are negative weight cycles or not, but at this point, you can say, I'm going to do one more pass. So the, the vth pass, the v is the number of vertices over the graph. And so for each edge in the graph, if you do one more relaxation and you see that dv is greater than du plus wuv, so you're not doing a relaxation, you're doing a check to see if you can relax 
the edge, then report minus v cycle exists, okay? negative cycle exists. Right. So this is the check. And the first part is the, is the computation. So that's kind of neat. I mean, it fits on a board. Uh, we'll talk about the correctness. The functionality, I hope everyone got. Do people understand wh what's happening here with respect to functionality? Any questions? Not about correctness, but functionality, yeah? Where does the i index get used in the formula? Oh, it doesn't. Uh, you, just, you just make, uh, it's just a counter that makes sure that you do v minus 1 passes. So. Um, so what's the, what's the complexity of this algorithm using the best data structure that we can think of? Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. plus e, or big O, v plus e, if you're using a dictionary to access the edges. V plus e? Or v, v e plus e. So that would be? Uh, that's using a dictionary. Yeah, no, V E plus E would be? That's correct. That's but, the complexity. Right, but I mean when you do V E plus E you can can you can you can you can ignore the E. Oh, okay. Right. So uh, assume that you have uh, uh, so you have it's just V, v times V times E. All right, good. So there you go. Um, so this part here is V times Z. And it doesn't really matter. I mean you can use an array structure, adjacency list. It's not like Dijkstra where we had this uh, this neat requirement for a priority queue, and there's different ways of implementing the priority queue. Um, this part would be order of VE, and that gives you the overall complexity. This part here is only one pass through the edges, so that's order E, like you said. Um, and so the complexity is order VE. And, and this could be large. Uh, as I said before, in I think the first lecture, uh, E could be is order v square in a, a, a simple graph. And so we might end up with a v cubed complexity if you run Bellman Ford. So there's no question that Bellman Ford is, from a practical standpoint, substantially slower than Dijkstra. You can get Dijkstra down to the linear complexity. Uh, but uh, this would potentially, at least in terms of vertices, be uh, a, a, a cubic complexity. So when, when you have a chance, you want to use Dijkstra, and you're forced to use Bellman Ford because you could potentially have negative weight cycles. Well, you're stuck with that. All right? OK, so why does this work? I mean, this looks a bit like magic. It turns out uh, we can actually do a fairly straightforward proof of correctness of Bellman Ford. And we're going to do two things. We're going to not only show that if negative weight cycles don't exist, that this will correct, this will, excuse me, correctly compute shortest paths, but we also have to show that it will detect negative weight cycles if they in fact exist. All right, so there's two parts to this, and let's start. So what we have here for this algorithm is that it can guarantee in a graph G equals VE if it contains no negative weight cycles then after Bellman Ford finishes execution, dv equals delta sv for all v belonging to v. All right? And then there's, there's that. That's the theorem we want to prove. And the second part, piece of it is this corollary that we want to prove. And that has to do with the check. And this says, if a value d of v fails to converge 
after v minus 1 passes, there exists a negative weight cycle reachable from S. All right, so those, those are the two things that, that we need to show. Um, I'll probably take a few minutes to do each of these. Uh, the theorem is a little more involved. Uh, so one of the first things that we have to do in order to prove this theorem um, is to think about exactly what the shortest path corresponds to uh, in a generic sense. So when we have a source vertex, a source vertex S and you have a particular vertex V, then here's the picture that we need to keep in mind as we try and prove this theorem. So you have V0, V1, V2, et cetera, all the way to Vk. I'm going to, this is my vertex V. This is S. So S equals V0, uh, V equals Vk. All right, so I'm going to have a path P that is uh, V0, V1, all the way to Vk. OK? Um, how, how big is K in the, in the worst case? How big is K? Anybody? How big is K? It's up, up on the blackboard. V minus 1, right? Why? Why is, why is K? What would happen if K is larger than, than V minus 1? I wouldn't have, I'd have a cycle. I'd be visiting a vertex more than once, and it wouldn't be a, a simple path, right? So, so K is less than or equal to V minus 1. Else, I'd have a cycle. OK? And I wouldn't have a simple path. And we're looking for the shortest simple paths, because if we ever get to the point where, why are we looking for shortest simple paths? Well, we're looking for, in this case, uh, uh, we, we're looking for shortest simple paths. And if there's a negative cycle, uh, we're, 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 we're in trouble, right? Because the shortest path is not necessarily the, uh, uh, the, sim the simple path, because you could go around the cycle a bunch of times. Um, I'll get back to that. But uh, in, in the case where we're trying to prove the theorem, we, we know that no negative cycles exist. We can assume that no negative cycles exist for the case of the theorem. And we want to show that Bellman Ford correctly computes each of the shortest path weights. And in that case, there's no negative weight cycles. We are guaranteed that k is less than or equal to v minus 1. All right? Everybody buy that? Good. All right, so that's the picture I want you to keep in mind. Let's uh, dive in and prove this, prove this theorem. And we can prove it using induction. So let V be any vertex. And let's say that we're looking at a path V0, V1, V2 to Vk. And like I said, from V0 equals S to Vk equals V. Uh, and in particular, I'm now going to say that this path um, P is a shortest path with the minimum number of edges. Okay, so there may be many shortest paths, and I'm going to pick the one that has the minimum number of edges. If there's a unique shortest path, then that's a given. But it may be that I have a path with uh, four edges uh, and that has the same weight as another path with three edges. I'm going to pick the one that has three edges. OK? So it, it may not be unique with respect to the not necessarily unique shortest paths, but I can certainly pick one. And 
no negative weight cycles implies that P is simple. And that implies that k is less than or equal to v minus 1, which is what I just argued. Now, keep in mind that picture over there to the right. And basically, the argument is going to go as follows. Remember that I'm going to be relaxing every edge in each pass of the algorithm. Okay, There's no choices here. There are no choices here. I'm going to be relaxing every edge in each pass of the algorithm. And essentially, the proof goes as follows. I'm going to be moving closer and closer to vk and constructing this shortest path at every pass. All right, so at some point in the first pass, I'm going to relax this edge v0, v1. Okay? And at that point, um, thanks to the optimum substructure property, um, given that this is a shortest path, this has to be a shortest path as well. Right? Any subset of the shortest path has to be a shortest path. Um, I'm, going to be, I'm going to relax this edge, and I'm going to get uh, the value of delta from s to v1. And th it's going to be this uh, relaxation that's going to get me that value. And after the first pass, I'm going to be able to get to v1. After the second pass, I can get to v2. And after k passes, I'm going to be able to get to vk. Right? So I'm just growing this frontier one node every pass. And that's your, your, your induction. And you can you know, write that out, and I'll, I'll, I'll write it out here. But that's basically it. So after one pass through all of the edges E, we have D of V1 to be delta SV1. And the reason for this is we'll, because we'll relax we guarantee to relax all the, all the edges, and we will relax the edge v0, v1 during this pass. Right? And we, we can't find a shorter path than this path, because otherwise we'd violate the optimum substructure property. right? Um, and uh, we, we, that means that we, it's a contradiction that we selected a shortest path in the first place. And so we can argue that we have delta s v1 after the first pass. And this goes on. I'm, I'm going to write out this proof because I think it's important for you guys to see uh, the full proof. But you, you could probably guess the rest at this point. After one pass, that's what you get. After two passes, through E, we have dv2 equals delta sv2. Because in the second pass, we're going to relax edge v1, v2. So it's a different edge that needs to be relaxed, but that's cool because I'm relaxing all the edges. And I'm going to be able to grow my frontier. I'm going to be able to compute delta s v2 at the end of my second pass, and so on and so forth. Uh, so after k passes, we have dv1 vk excuse me, equals delta s vk. And since um, if, I, uh, 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 if I run through v minus 1 passes, which is what I do in the algorithm, all reachable vertices have delta values. All right, that's basically it. Any questions? It's actually a simpler proof than, than the Dijkstra proof, uh, which I just sketched last time. I'll just give you some in intuition of the Dijkstra proof. It's probably a little too 
uh, painful to do in a, in a lecture, uh, but this one is, uh, as you can see, uh, nice and clean and fits on two boards, which is kind of the important criterion here. Uh, so, so good. All right. Um, so that takes care of the theorem. Uh, hopefully, you're all on board with the theorem. And uh, one thing that we haven't done is talk about the check. And so the argument with respect to the corollary bootstraps this particular argument for the theorem, but just requires the insight that if after v minus 1 passes, if you can find an edge that can be relaxed, well, what does that mean? So so at this point, let's say that I've done my v minus 1 passes. And we find an edge that can be relaxed. Well, this means that the current shortest path from S to some vertex that is obviously reachable, V is not simple. Once I've relaxed this edge, because I have a repeated vertex. Right? So that means if I have, it's not simple to have a repeated vertex that's the same as I found a cycle. And it's a negative weight cycle because I was able to relax the edge and reduce the weight after I added a vertex that caused the cycle. All right? And so this cycle has to be negative weight. Found a cycle that is negative weight. All right, that's pretty much it. Um, so it's, a, I guess, a, a painful algorithm from a standpoint of it's not particularly smart. It's just relaxing all of the edges a certain fixed number of times. And it just works out because you will uh, find these cycles. And uh, if, if you uh, keep going, it's like this termination condition. What was neat is that I don't have the generic shortest path algorithm up there anymore. But in effect, what you're saying is, after a certain number of passes, if you haven't finished, you can quit because you uh, have found a negative cycle. Right? So it's very similar to the generic shortest path algorithm. Um, you're not really selecting the edges. You're selecting all of them if you, in this case. And you're, you're running through a bunch of, bunch of different passes. All right? Um, so that's it with respect to Bellman Ford. I want to do a couple of uh, special cases and revisit the directed acyclic graph. Uh, but stop me here if, if you have any questions about, about Bellman Ford. Uh, you first, and then back there. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm just confused about the definition of a cycle. But if you had like a tree which had like a negative weight edge, wouldn't it produce the same situation where you checked it, you'd relax that edge? And but you would have relaxed that edge previously. Cycle, right? Yeah, it wouldn't be a cycle. So let's let's look at that. That's a, that's a fine question. Um, well, if you have a tree, I mean, a tree is a really simple case, but uh, if you had you know, something like this, and if you did have uh, a minus 1 uh, edge here, right? We could do, we could, we'll do a more complicated example. But let's say you had something like this, 2, 3, minus 1. Then what would happen is if this happens to be your s vertex, and uh, the in the first step, you, well, you relax all the edges, and this one would get 2, right? Uh, and then uh, depending on the order in which you relaxed, um, it's quite possible that if you relax this edge first, um, let's say uh, that uh, you relax uh, in the first pass, uh, the ordering of the relaxation is 1, 2, and 3. So the edges are ordered in a certain way. 
uh, each time, and you're going to be relaxing the edges in exactly the same order each time. All right? Um, it doesn't matter. The, the beauty of Bellman Ford is that, let's say you relax this edge. Initially, this is at infinity. So uh, this is at 0, this is at infinity, this is at infinity, this is at infinity. All right? If you relax this edge, nothing happens. All right? um, uh, then you relax, let's say, this edge, because that's number 2. This gets set to 2. Um, you relax this edge, because that's 3. And this is infinity, so nothing happens. Of course, this is already at 2, so nothing would happen. So at the end of the first pass, what you have is this is 0, that's 2. This is still infinity. Um, that's still infinity. Okay? Um, that's going to stay infinity, because you can't reach it from s. So we can sort of ignore that. At the end of the second pass, um, what, what you have is you start with this edge again, okay? uh, because that's the ordering. And this 2 minus 1 would give this uh, a 1. All right? and, and then you relax this edge, or try to relax this edge. Nothing happens. Try to relax this edge. Nothing happens. Um, and at this point, you have one more pass to go, because you've got four vertices. And in that pass, nothing changes again. Okay? Um, and so that's what you end up with. You, get, you end up with um, two for this and, and one for that. OK? That makes sense? All right. So the important thing to understand is that you are actually relaxing all of the edges in every pass. And there's a slightly more complicated example than this that uh, is in the notes. And you can take a look at that offline. There was another question at the back. Did you have a question? Someone raised a hand. Yeah. Just I'm just curious, is there a known better algorithm that is doing the same thing? No, there's no known better algorithm for solving the general case like this. There are uh, a couple of algorithms that assume weights uh, are within a certain range, and then their complexities include both V and E as well as W, where W is the dynamic range of the weights. And depending on what W is, they, they, you could argue that they have better complexity, but they're kind of incomparable in the sense that they have this extra parameter, which is the dynamic range of the W. Okay? Now, there are lots of special cases, like I said, and we'll take a look at the DAG special case in, in a second, where you could uh, imagine doing better, but not for the case where you have an arbitrary graph that could have negative cycles in it because it's got negative weight edges. Does that assume you have a connected graph? Because if you know you could have a negative weight edge in a separate part of the graph, which isn't reachable from us, um, and it's you know, it, uh, yeah. So so everything here, um, you're you're going to start uh, it, with uh, it, when you have an undefined weight. Uh, remember that you uh, your initialization condition. What what is affected by s? Initialize is affected by s. The rest of it isn't affected by s, because you're just relaxing the edges. Right? Initialize is affected by s, because d of s starts out being 0, like I put over here, and the rest of them are infinity. Okay? So there is an effect of the choice of the starting vertex. And uh, the rest of it follows that you will get um, uh, an, uh, an undefined value, or you will find that the negative cycle exists. Um, based on whether you can reach it from s or not. So if you happen to have s uh, um, uh, over here, and it's just the one node, and then, every, and then it has no edges going out of it, right? Uh, I, I, this, well, I mean, this algorithm would just be, be, be trivial, but uh, it wouldn't detect any negative cycles that aren't reachable from s. Right? That makes sense? Yeah. Right? So, so there is this, uh, it's kind of hidden over there, and I'm, so I'm glad you asked that question, but initialize is setting things up, and that. Is, is something that um, affects the rest of the algorithm, because d of s is 0, and the rest of them are set to infinity. All right? So in the, 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 if there are no other questions, um, I'll uh, move on to the special case of the DAG and talk a little bit about shortest paths versus longest paths. And, and look, this is somewhat of a preview of a lecture that, uh, that uh, Eric would, is going to give a, a month from now on, on complexity and the difference between polynomial time and and exponential time, though I'm not going to go into much depth here. But there's some interesting uh, relationships between the shortest path uh, uh, problem and the longest path problem uh, that I'd like to get to. But any other questions on this? OK. So let me ask a question. Um, suppose I wanted to find longest paths 
in a graph. And let's say that this graph had all positive edge weights. OK? Um, what if I negated all of the edge weights and ran a Bellman 4? Would I, would I find the longest path in the graph? Do people understand the question? So I can, I don't need this. So maybe we can, we can talk about what a longest path means first. So if this was S and this is V1, V2, V3, um, fairly straightforward. You know how to compute shortest paths now. Uh, these are all positive, even easier. Um, the longest path to V3 is of length. Six, because I go here, go there, and go there. Right? So that's my longest path. Okay? And the shortest path to V3 is of length four. Okay? So shortest paths, longest paths have this nice duality. Um, what if um, I, I said, well, you know, I can solve the longest path problem as well, given all of what I've learned about shortest paths, simply by negating. each of these edges and running Bellman forward. What would happen? Yeah? Yeah, now we can make the shortest path branch on this <coughs> and like with the negative and values. And then if you switch the absolute value, it will give you the biggest, the longest path. So you think it works? But I think, I think that's the key question. What would Bellman Ford do when it's run on this? What would it return? No, what would Bellman Ford return? I'm asking. Someone else? What would Bellman Ford return if I ran this? Undefined, right? Undefined. Because you got this negative weight cycle here. Sorry? Oh. Let's put another one in there. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Now I see. You're right. You're right. I'm wrong. And why did you say undefined? I was wrong. Uh, OK, good. So I got company. I got company. Thank you. Thank you. Right? Um, good. Let's, let's oh, take it all over again. All over again. All right? All right, start over. S, V1, V2, V3. Um, so, yeah, that is a cycle. All right, good. Cycle. Um, so uh, when, you, when you actually negate each of these edges, um, you, you end up with, with a negative weight cycle. So it's possible that you could have a graph like this one where this strategy won't work. Right? Um, because what would happen is Bellman Ford would come back with uh, essentially a, a, an abort that says, uh, I, I can't compute shortest paths because they're undefined. All right? Now, it turns out it's actually you know, more, more, more subtle than that. Um, what we're trying to do in Bellman Ford is in the case where negative weight cycles don't exist, We report on the shortest simple path. Right? That's, that's the whole notion of the proof. We say that the path has a certain length, which is at most v minus 1, um, and so on and so forth. We get the shortest simple path. Um, but if you, if you actually have a problem where you say, Let's say I uh, go to, uh, let, me, let me start over again. Let, let's say I, I want to find the shortest simple path for a, different, for a different graph, right? And it happens to have a negative weight cycle in it. 
So I have something like this, 2, 3, minus 6, 3 over here, 3 over here, and so on. Maybe 2 here. And I want to find the shortest simple path that reaches v from s. OK? What is the shortest simple path that reaches v from s? It's this path that goes horizontally, which goes, you know, it has a weight 3 plus 2, 5, 5 plus 3, 8, 8 plus 3, 11, 11 plus um, 2, 13. All right? So the shortest simple path is 13. Will Benjamin Ford give you any information about this path? No, because it'll abort, right? After the, 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 it does its v minus 1 passes, um, v is reachable from s, but um, you can, you, you go through, potentially go through a negative weight cycle before you reach v, OK? So it turns out that if you have a graph with negative weight cycles, finding the shortest simple path is an NP-hard problem. It's a really hard problem. That's what NP means. No. <laughs> it, means, it means something else that Eric will explain to you uh, in, 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 a, in a month or so. But it means that we don't know any algorithm that is better than exponential time to solve this problem. OK? So amazingly, you know, you've, all you've done is taken the shortest path problem and changed it ever so slightly. You said, I want to look for the shortest simple path in the general case where I could potentially have negative weight cycles in my graph. And when you do that, all bets are off. You're not in the polynomial time complexity domain anymore, at least not that we know of. Um, and uh, th the best that you can do is an exponential time algorithm to find shortest simple paths. And this problem, as it turns out, is equivalent to the longest path problem uh, in the sense that they're both NP-hard. And if you could solve one, you could solve the other. All right? And so to summarize, what happens here simply is that in the case of Bellman Ford running on the uh, original shortest path problem, you're, you're allowed to abort when uh, you detect the fact that there's a negative cycle. Right? So given that you're allowed to abort when there's a negative cycle, you have a polynomial time solution using Bellman Ford that is not necessarily you know, going to give you shortest path weights, uh, but will in the case of no negative cycles. All right? But if you ask for more, a little bit more, you said, you know, it'd be great if you could somehow process these negative cycles and tell me that if I had a simple path and I, I don't go through cycles, what would the shortest weight be? It becomes a much more difficult problem, right? It goes from order of VE complexity to exponential time complexity to the best of our knowledge. All right? So, so that's what I'd like to leave you with, uh, that there's much more to, uh, uh, to algorithms than just the ones that we're looking at. And we'll get a little bit of a preview of this, so the difference between polynomial time and exponential time later on in the term. <laughs>